It is possible. This is the one thought for you to take into the day and carry it with you every moment it comes in your mind. Change is possible. Transformation is possible. Being reformed, remolded, reshaped into a person who looks like God intended when he first thought me up, that actually is a possibility. I was with Michael Ware. Uh, last evening, we all got to talk with him uh, not too long ago on one of our videos, and Michael was talking about a German so, uh, German suicidologist. That's a tough job. Herbert Pluge, I think, was the man's name, and he studied people that had been severely depressed or had attempted suicide but survived and eventually recovered, eventually flourished and clung to their lives. And he said what they all had in common was that they found a foundational hope something that transcended circumstances, not for this circumstance or that circumstance, but gave them a way to withstand any circumstance. But he said in order to come to a foundational hope, they had to be disappointed in their little hopes. Money, power, uh, pleasure, my desires to be on the throne. What is the foundational hope? There has never been any like the one expressed by Jesus and his followers in the New Testament. And Paul puts it like this. Dallas quotes this on page 77 of Renovation of the Heart. But we all with unveiled faces, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord, the Spirit. That's from 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. This is the foundational hope. The transformation of human lives into a character, a spirit that is glorious in truth and courage and moral beauty and love and joy. And there is nobody else that stewards this hope. There is no political vision for this. There is no political legislation or party or program or leader who can stand before any nation and say, we are being transformed from glory to glory by the power that, that is not something politics gets done. Mike was saying last night that a pastor had told him recently, 15 years ago, if somebody asked him out for coffee, it would be to talk about uh, what about people who are of a different religion, what happens to them, or why is there evil suffering in the world? Now, when people ask him out for coffee, he knows they're going to want to know, who did you vote for? Where does our church stand politically? As though politics is the most relevant realm. The ultimate hope, the foundational hope for the transformation of human life into glorious character is not a political hope. It ought to inform politics, but in fact, the best contribution the church can actually make to the political realm is to offer people who are being shaped that way and whose eternal life will far outlast any political system. There is no economic system that will produce that. There is no educational curriculum that will produce that. There is no school of therapy that even has a vision to produce human beings who are glorious and transcendent and spiritually mature into their character, and it is possible. Here's what Dallas writes, page 77. First of all, we must be clear that such a transition as is envisioned in Christian spiritual formation can actually happen and can actually happen to us. It is possible. It can happen. But Dallas writes, this today is not obvious. Michael was mentioning that uh, there's a quite sobering statistic when people are asked, is religion part of the answer to the world's problems or is it itself part of the world's problems? Uh, Historically, the response to that has been 80-20. Um, faith is part of the answer to the world's problems. Most recently, in the most recent survey, it was 52% to 47 point something percent. We have lost confidence that the way of Jesus is the way to produce transformed human beings. And Dallas talks about a couple of reasons. Before getting into, which we will do, but not today, before getting into the pattern the framework that makes transformation possible, 
we have to address why do we think it can't happen. One reason is there are so many Christian leaders who are not transformed. And when they fall, uh, it causes everybody to be deeply troubled. Am I following a way that is really effective? Too often, untransformed leadership in churches aim just at successful ministry and scandal avoidance. And Dallas writes, The sad thing when a leader or any individual fails is not just what he or she did, but the heart and life and whole person who is revealed by the act. What is sad is who those leaders have been all along, what their inner life has been like, and no doubt also how they have suffered during all the years before they did it or were found out, what kind of persons they have been. Real spiritual need and change, he writes, as we have emphasized, is on the inside, in the hidden area of life that God sees and that we cannot see even in ourselves without his help. Indeed, in the early stages of spiritual development, uh, this is really amazing. In the early stages of spiritual development, we could not endure seeing our inner reality as it really is. The possibility of denial and self-deception is something God has made accessible to us in part to protect us until we begin to seek him. Like the face of the mythical Medusa, our true condition away from God will turn us to stone if we ever fully confronted it. It would drive us mad. He has to help us come to terms with it in ways that will not destroy us outright. There's that uh, old movie where there's a scene with Jack Nicholson and Tom Cruise, and Tom Cruise says, I just want to know the truth, and Nicholson says, you can't handle the truth. And what Dallas is saying here is, I can't handle the truth. I am one of those Christian leaders and have been on a journey that's been very difficult and very public. And part of what is true, whatever else is true or not true that I don't even fully understand, is my own great need for transformation from the inside. Dallas says, without the gentle but rigorous process of inner transformation, initiated and sustained by the graceful presence of God in our world, the change of personality in life clearly announced and spelled out in the Bible, explained and illustrated throughout Christian history, is impossible. We not only admit it, we insist upon it. But on the other hand, the result of the effort to change our behavior without inner transformation is precisely what we see in the current shallowness of Western Christianity that is so widely lamented and in the notorious failures of Christian leaders. So uh, we tend to think our true transformation isn't really possible when we see failures in others, particularly untransformed Christian leaders. And then he said another reason is what he calls miserable sinner Christianity. And it's the idea that nobody ever really changes. Um, Mother Teresa and Hitler are morally interchangeable. All her acts of service and love did not actually make her character any better. All of his acts of desperate sin and evil didn't actually make his character any worse. We're all the same. Now, Della says the little glimmer of truth in that is there is always a spark of evil in us waiting to be fanned in the flame. We are all vulnerable. Uh, what we are given, as the big book of AA says, is a daily reprieve based on the maintenance of our spiritual condition. In spiritual life, Dallas writes, one never rests on one's laurels. It is a sure recipe for failing. Attainments are like manna given to the Israelites in the desert, good only for today. Past attainments do not place us in a position of merit that permits us to let up in the hot pursuit of God for today. But Paul knew that. He knew others missed it or forgot it to their great harm. The transformation of our, our inner selves is not something based on how well leaders may happen to do. It is not closed off to us because we're condemned to be never anything more than as miserable as we are right now who cannot change. And then also it's very important to understand we don't do this on our own. We do this by grace. We seek to grow through grace. And I'll give you one little picture of this. I was talking to a friend yesterday at lunch and he'd been speaking with a woman, not a Christian leader, not well known, very simple person, very quiet person. 
and, and they were talking about prayer. And she said, I pray about everything. And he was wondering if that was kind of a cliche. So he said, like, today, what have you prayed for? And she said, well, like at breakfast this morning, I prayed that God would help make the oranges taste sweet to me. It had never occurred to me before hearing that to think about asking God to make my food taste good to me. But of course, the psalmist said a long time ago, taste and see that the Lord is good. And the way that we do that is from one moment to the next as we experience His care, which is His grace in our lives. That is experience-based confidence in God's loving care. It is possible. So today, from one moment to the next, God, make the oranges taste sweet to me. God, let me find your goodness in this moment, in this food, in that sunlight, in this person's face, in that person's word, in this thought. For we are being transformed in the fellowship of the withered hand. We can't, but God can. We're doing it together. God, make the oranges sweet. See you next time. Hey, thanks for joining us. Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel and click the bell so you never miss an episode. There are emails that go along with each video. If you'd like to receive those, you can let us know at becomenew.me slash subscribe.